A very good morning to you all. So I'll be talking about the um, management K pathway. Um, it's very tricky um, to uh, give a pathway it's, uh, that will cater to all our uh, patients uh, with uh, obesity. So um, this is, um, if I'm going to address a mixed group, I would say one shoes wouldn't fit all, but because we are predominantly uh, young and very um, young ladies here, I would say one blouse wouldn't fit all. We all know how difficult it is to find um, a, a tailor who would make a perfect blouse, and some of us are still looking for the perfect tailor, and some of us have given up and have uh, changed to salvars and western wear, but still you need to find a, a good outfit that will make you look smart. So I'm going to uh, discuss a uh, care pathway. This is not a protocol, but these are the elements uh, we should be incorporating into our proforma so that we do not miss any of these points when we are uh, looking into managing uh, a woman with uh, obesity. So once we have identified a candidate and we have evaluated the cause of obesity, now is the most difficult part, is to prescribe a, a diet that she's going to be happy with. That is the perfect blouse we're talking about. So it should be affordable, appropriate, sustainable, doable, and scientifically backed. And it has to be balanced. So that's what we're going to provide. And that's the most trickiest part of our consult, is to find a diet that the lady is going to be happy with, and it is going. she's going to be following the instructions that you give. Next is physical activity. Though it's not going to contribute a lot to weight weight loss is going to keep her fit. And then again, this has to be tailored to the lady that's in front of you. Minimum of 60 minutes, it could be a combination of aerobic or weight, sustainable and patient preferred. Um, behavioral modification again is very, very important because we see a lot of children with obesity these days. And this is because of the increase in screen time that has gone up significantly during the COVID time where they have all been provided with a smartphone or an iPad where they have to um, attend the uh, Zoom classes. So we'll have to look into the screen time. Every obese child that comes into the clinic always asks the parents for the screen time, reduce the screen time, find out eating habits. What triggers the eating pattern or the behavior? Is it depression? or what kind of eating pattern they have. And this is something uh, that discussants can discuss a bit more in detail. And again, physical activity and self-monitoring of their weight at home. So all this we need to address during our consult. Of course, we have the pharmacotherapy, the medications and um, the devices and bariatric surgery, which we would be choosing depending upon the patients after we have prescribed them the right diet and physical activity. But the ninth point is again the most, uh, one of the most important points is counseling. None of what we discussed before is going to work unless the patient in front of you is really motivated and really wants to lose weight. So I ask the patient, is it really you who want to lose weight or you're here because somebody else asked you to see? It could be your general physician or an obstetrician or your orthopedic surgeon who says just go and lose weight and go and see this doctor. If you're here to see me just because somebody else just wants you to lose weight, then you're not going to lose weight. It's the motivation level of the patient. Sometimes they come in motivated, sometimes you'll have to motivate them to lose weight. But if they have zero motivation, then you're starting from scratch and that makes it difficult. So in our care pathway, we'll have to ensure how motivated they are to begin with, and then you start somewhere and build upon their motivation. So motivating a patient is a skill in itself. And that we need to develop as physicians, we need to develop and practice uh, over a period of time and build our skills. So we'll have to discuss challenges both from their side and from our side. And we'll have to address all these fat diets and alternate therapy they might be already following or they might have tried in the past. Follow-up is very, very important because this keeps their motivation up. So we need to follow these patients up. I have three nutritionists with me now, and every patient with diabetes or obesity that I see in the clinic, a week later, they'll have to call them up to just double check if they're, they're able to follow the prescription that we have given, if they're able to follow the diet that we have prescribed, 
and if there are any challenges, they can address over the phone. So unless you have a very close follow-up and not see them once in three months, then we are already winning. So we'll have to have a closer follow-up, either in person or in telemedicine, and group sessions do work um, in certain group of patients. So I'd like the discussions now to discuss a few points now on um, how uh, eating patterns can influence and, and some of the other um, indications, like when do you suggest uh, bariatric surgery for our patients, yes. Thanks, Vidya. Um, I'm going to go a little bit different because I know we're not forming an algorithm of uh, care over here. This is not, um, uh, we're not an organization to form that. Um, I'll just take a little bit of different, and while I was sitting uh, and walking up over here, I thought I'll do it this way. Um, let me take two cases, arbitrary cases that we see all the time in our clinic two women who've come to our clinic. One, for instance, is a young girl who, uh, her mother is my diabetic patient, for instance. And this young lady is supposed to be get married about six months later or so. So she just comes, sits in front with her mother and asks me, for instance, she says, I think I am overweight and I'm getting married six months later. I want to look good. I want to feel good. I want to look good. So this is one case. And the second one, which uh, maybe we'll discuss, is a real person, I mean a real patient who comes at about 35 or 36 years old, who's my hypothyroid patient, and she has been told by the orthopedics that she has knee problems and maybe osteoarthritis setting in. How should I go about? You are an endocrine or a hormone specialist, you tell me. So let's take these two arbitrary patients and see how we can work them up for obesity or overweight. And Gagan, please pitch in and both of you also because they're just on the top of my head, you know. So the young woman who comes and who wants to get fit is wants to know if she's obese or not or overweight or not. Now in my clinic, I just have a BMI measurement which the nurse takes height, weight, and a, a circumference, uh, you know, a, a tape. So I get that done and I see that she is about 24, 25 BMI. I don't have anything else. I have a waist circumference measure and she's about 88 or 90-ish kind of a thing. And I tell her, yes, you are not at the ideal BMI for Indians, which would be 23. You're 24, 25, for instance. You're slightly over the top. What is your, do you think you're overweight? So she says, yeah, my clothes are tight and I feel bloated and all of that kind of thing. Then I ask her, have you always been like this or were you five years ago thinner or did your clothes fit in better and all that? To try and gauge what is the duration of this overweight uh, situation and uh, you know get her answers and i ask her about what are the rest of your family are they all overweight are they all obese and then she gives me that so i'm trying to get a feel of what is the family pattern and how long has her obesity or over overweight uh, situation been there has she been on any medications uh, of course, as we heard just a little while ago, oral contraceptive pills may not necessarily, uh, you may not become obese if you were normal body weight, but you may gain one or two uh, kgs or a little bit. What is your exercise level? How active are you? And, uh, you know, are you stressed out? Are you one of those, are you working in a BP or some nighttime job that you're getting up at night, you're working late hours, you have shift hours, your whole rhythm of hormones is um, upside down. Are you eating late at night? And what is your meal pattern? Things like that. And then I find out that she's actually as sedentary as I am. She has a desk, desk job. And, uh, uh, you know, we heard, uh, and then although her BMI is not huge, her waist circumference is not so bad, but maybe she has a lot of body fat. Distribution may be wrong. You know, we've all heard of the famous YY paradox um, many years ago, I think maybe 15 years ago, when Dr. Yagnik and the other uh, obesity expert from UK, both with the same BMI and Dr. Yagnik's uh, body fat was like 20 uh, or maybe more, and this guy was only nine. 
and then somebody asked him how come both BMI same but the fat distribution is not distribution the fat uh, amount is so percentage is so different and the uh, guy who was the the UK f fellow scientist he said I do marathons I exercise so much and Dr. Yagnik apparently I was I've just heard about it and read about it he says his activity is going to the refrigerator door or catching the lift or something like that that's like most of us you know so this lady may not be hugely fat not doesn't look fat at all um, but her percentage fat her distribution of fat all those make a difference also so those are very important things and the meal patterns and all that so I think one can start with that kind of history, stress level, emotional level, and all of that, and then put it all together. So I think Dr. Anjali, yes, ma'am. One minute. One minute. Yeah. So I think uh, what uh, Dr. Anjana has brought on a very important point that we have to understand the psychological factors behind obesity and also the psychological impact of obesity. So if I would like to summarize, you know, what has been discussed in the panel and by uh, our wonderful panelists here and Dr. Anjana was also highlighting, what I love, you know, I love Tripta's uh, bathe synonym and uh, that reminded me of the five-way approach that the World Obesity Federation recommends. A, ask permission for discussing body weight because it is a stigmatizing issue. So you have to bring it up very gently, calling people obese or you know labeling obesity might not be the best way. Discuss their patterns of weight gain, weight loss over a period of time, but definitely ask permission. Second is assess. Assess for causes that are leading to obesity. Are they secondary causes? Are they just lifestyle related factors? If they are lifestyle related factors, where is the problem? There might be somebody who's binge eating or craving or who has a stressful job and then goes home and you know gulps up a lot of food. So try to assess those factors. And also the second assess is assess the impact that obesity has in uh, Dr. Anjali's model that was there. Assess the impact. Just labeling class 1, 2, 3 obesity based on BMI is not good enough. You should try and see what is the comorbidity that this obesity is causing. Is it mechanical problems like osteoarthritis or does a person, the lady have diabetes or is high risk of GDM and so on. The uh, next thing you have to do is advise the patient as to what can be done. You know, just telling you need to lose 15 kilos weight is not really enough. We can advise them that this is what is there. And a part of that advice would also include motivation. The next approach would be assist. You know, assist them in reaching those targets. Give them a kind of a nutrition plan or an exercise plan. You have to overcome the barriers. You know, I get women telling us, you know, we can't walk in our village. What to do? There's no way to walk. There are stray dogs on the road. So we have to figure out ways and means of assisting them. Where they need a psychology counselor's help or where they need bariatric surgery, that has to be then provided. And then we have to arrange for these facilities. So I think the entire care can be, you know, uh, threaded through these five A's and uh, thank you so much.